Fantastic. Um, thank you, Fabinia. Um, and of course, thank you all for being here, especially to Tobias and Mark for having me back and for keeping up the habit of putting me on first. Uh, which, and of course, thank you for Daniel for his absolutely wonderful hospitality. I think I can safely say that I am not the only person here who is here for that. But of course, I'm also here for all the other things that Daniel listed. Um, so yes, um, and of course, uh, Daniel went to Eton and I went to Harrow, so we have to be slightly insulting to each other. It's like it goes with the territory. Um, so I thank you so much. Okay, so um, for those of you who don't know, I run a foundation. Well, I lead a foundation, um, which means it's a non-profit. So what the hell am I doing here at an investors' conference? Um, well, I'm going to try to explain that. I'm going to start by just a few minutes of giving you some context for what aging is, or the way that I like to describe it in a way that, if you like, demystifies aging. Then I'm going to talk about, as Sabina said, <coughs> the flagship project that we have at LEB Foundation, um, which is the first of what we hope will be a sequence of really groundbreaking studies that will give far more information about how we can postpone the health problems of late life, of course, not only in mice, but eventually in human beings. Um, and then I'll tell you why you should care, because, um, as I say, I run a foundation, so if you give me money, you're not getting any of it back. Um, and I hope I'm going to be able to convince you. Um, so, first of all, the demystification of ageing. Um, so, this is the big paradoxical question that I always like to begin with, to, make, to focus people on. People say, well, okay, look, um, we've got these diseases of ageing. Um, let's just try to attack them the way that um, we have so successfully attacked the diseases of early life, uh, the infectious diseases that used to kill literally more than one-third of babies before the age of one, even in the wealthiest countries in the world. You know, this was only 200 years ago that that was the case. And just discovering that hygiene is a good idea, um, let alone all the you know, elementary medicines like antibiotics um, that we brought, were brought in, <clears throat> 150 years ago or so, uh, you know, that's done a lot of good. It's saved a hell of a lot of lives. It's a great success story. But of course, what it has had as a side effect is the emergence and the growth of the epidemic of age-related health conditions. So I like to point out that we already kind of know what to do about that because the human body is a machine. It's a viciously complicated machine, and of course we don't understand its composition and its me uh, mechanisms very well, in fact hardly at all, but the fact is it's still a machine. And um, as such, its, you know, its function is determined by its structure, and we can learn about how to transcend the, if you like, the warranty period of the machine called the human body, by looking at how we already successfully transcend the warranty period of simple man-made machines like cars. This car has very much transcended its warranty period. It was originally built to last maybe 10 or 15 years, and here it is, working just as well as when it was built, um, despite the fact that it was built more than 100 years ago. So how can we use that information? Well, basically it's like this. As I mentioned, the prevailing way in which we try to address the pathologies of late life is what I'm calling here the geriatrics approach, essentially pretending that they're just like infections, which is nonsense. The fact is, the health problems of late life are a side effect of being alive, of having been alive for a long time, and we can describe that in the way that I'm describing it here at the bottom of the slide. Metabolism, that's the word that biologists use to encompass all of the processes that keep us alive from one day to the next. It creates progressive accumulating changes to the microscopic structure and composition of the body. And I use the word damage to denote those changes simply because the body is set up to tolerate a certain amount of those changes, but only a certain amount. So eventually we have too much and we end up um, going to uh, having the pathologies of late life emerge and progress. I am looking at the clock that I've been given, and I'm delighted to see that rather than giving me 20 minutes, it's giving me 20 hours. It's going down. Uh, um, um, uh, 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 I'm delighted. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to move on to, um, uh, to what we're doing at LEV Foundation. We're doing mouse experiments. We're doing one really big mouse experiment right now. Um, and, of course, the first thing you're going to think, if you know anything about clinical trials and um, uh, biomedical research, is that the hit rate 
but of translation of successful um, mouse experiments to the clinic is very low. Lots of things, most things, don't work in humans, even if they worked in mice. We believe, however, that the kinds of things that we're working on, and I'm going to describe a little bit in a moment, um, are actually uh, much more likely to translate because they do not, if you like, mess with metabolism. They are not attempts to make the body run more cleanly. They are ways to remove the various types of damage that I just talked about. So we're fairly optimistic. And um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the rationale and the criteria that led us to the structure of the study that's been going on for the past 18 months or so, and then I'm going to um, uh, talk a little bit about why. Um, so here's the starting point. We want to rejuvenate people. We don't just want to slow aging down, we want to reverse aging. So we start, of course, with middle-aged mice. Mice of the um, strain that most people use for longevity experiments live about two and a half years, so we start at about one and a half years of age. We don't like to start really late. There have been some studies recently that have been quite eye-catching, starting at like two and a half years when half the mice are already dead. We don't like to do that because the mice that are not already dead are nearly dead. No, they're getting sick. And so we don't want to extend sick span, we want to extend health span. Um, but the key thing is we are combining treatments, and the treatments that we are combining involve cell therapies and gene therapies, which is something that nobody else is doing. Loads of people agree that these, these studies would be a great idea, but there are plenty of reasons why it has been very difficult for people to actually do them, and why we're the only people who've actually been able to. And essentially, they are listed on the bottom right of this slide. It's a big upfront budget. This study cost three and a half million dollars, and at least three million of that was, had to be paid upfront to buy the mice and to do these rejuvenation interventions, which happen at the beginning of the study. The costs after that essentially revolve around keeping the mice alive, which is not so expensive. Furthermore, and this is of course something that I'm going to be coming back to in an investors meeting, it doesn't generate significant IP. This is taking stuff that already exists and that has already shown promise individually and combining them. That might, there might be use patents out there, but there's definitely not going to be any new composition of matter patents. So, you know, it's difficult to get, in, get um, funding for these experiments that way. Um, then in terms of the uh, academic um, funding structures, we have huge problems that, you know, you're going to get negative results quite often. And uh, you know, that doesn't get easily published in high-profile journals. And also, you're not really testing hypotheses. You're not exploring mechanisms of action, which is the kind of thing that, again, you know, academia is biased in favor of. So it's really, really difficult to get this kind of stuff funded. But we're doing it. Um, this is what we're doing. As I say, we're starting with normal middle-aged mice. Uh, we want to extend their average lifespan. We want to um, extend their maximum lifespan as well. And we want to do it by a large amount, which I'll be coming back to in a moment. Um, we, as I say, are, use, are combining things which individually have shown some promise already. And this is the kind of study we're doing. On the left, we're, I'm describing a little bit about the health analyses that we're doing. We're looking at visual indicators, metabolic indicators, behavioral indicators, cognitive ones, physiological ones of health throughout the lifespan. And we're also uh, sacrificing some of the mice at certain times, as you can see on the right, um, in order to look at tissues in a way that you can't do non-invasively. But the key thing is the middle here. We have 10 treatment groups, not just two. We don't have just like a group that's getting the uh, four interventions that we're looking at and a group that's getting none of them. We also have four groups, each of which are getting one of them, and four groups, each of which are getting all but one. And that's critical. The one intervention group is to validate that we're doing the intervention correctly and we are properly re recapitulating prior work. And the, th the orbit one is to identify antagonistic interactions, which we believe are less likely for damage repair interventions than for, um, uh, for, for pharma pharmacological ones, but still, it's definitely something that needs to be addressed because we're going to get surprises in these things. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's bloody huge, this study. Look at the numbers on the left. You know, we've got a lot of treatment groups because we have um, you know, two sexes, we have two types of control, mock and naive, I can go into that later if you like. Um, you know, a lot of animals that we are taking necropsies from and taking plasma samples from, thousands of tissues that we are storing, either fixed or frozen, in order to collaborate with other groups to study them. 
It is absolutely humongous, this study. Um, here are the interventions. You've all heard of rapamycin, which is not really a damage repair intervention, but we wanted to put it into the first study because it is really the gold standard intervention that really works in, even in late onset middle-aged mice. Then we're doing what's called heterochronic bone marrow transplant. We're taking bone marrow from uh, young mice. We killed a lot of young mice for this. Um, and uh, purifying their stem cells and then injecting them into these older mice um, uh, so as to replace some of their stem cells with young ones. This, again, is something that has been shown to marginally extend lifespan on its own. Uh, then telomerase gene therapy. Uh, this is something that, uh, I mean, you've all heard of telomerase. Turns out that 10 years ago or so it was shown that this also can extend lifespan in normal mice. Um, uh, when given late in life, and that was repeated by another group quite recently, so we include that. And then a senolytic. Naviticlax is a well-known senolytic. It's, been, um, it's had quite a lot of uh, well-reproduced data coming out over the years. Uh, we have adopted a clever trick that was developed in Spain, whereby it is inactivated except in senescent cells by being conjugated with galactose. Uh, this, protects it from, uh, this protects platelets from being killed by it which is important. And so, yeah, we have this pipeline, um, which I've basically told you all about already. And this is where we're at. The study is not yet over. You can see that these survival curves, uh, you know, the, the uh, thick red line on each of these graphs is the group that are getting all four of the interventions. And you can see that more than a quarter of them are still alive. This is as of a month or two ago. Um, and the various other groups are doing less well. In particular, in females, the group that's getting nothing is doing worst. In males, the results are somewhat more um, complicated. You would expect some fluctuations, some, some surprises in this kind of experiment because there's so many treatment groups, you've got a lot of hypotheses that you're testing simultaneously. So we haven't attempted yet to do any of the rigorous statistical analysis that, that going to, that's going to await the end of the experiment, which we believe is at least another four to six months away. But we're definitely happy about how this is going. You know, we have obviously not knocked it out of the park. We haven't got immortal mice here, but we certainly have, in my view, firmly, unequivocally validated the concept of such an experiment. The, um, the, the value of combining damage repair interventions and indeed rapamycin, um, you know, all together and seeing what works together and what doesn't. And we have a number of further experiments of that nature that are already, <coughs> already planned. One of them is at um, our website, and um, you can read about it, but we have a lot of um, uh, ideas for new studies like that. And it's very hard, as I say, to get the money to do it. So now I'm going to tell you why you should care. Um, and it comes back to something that you've already heard from Mark and indeed from Sabinia. Um, this industry has not yet reached escape velocity. It is not really as turbocharged as the um, potential financial benefits would imply. And we have to ask why not? You know, there haven't been very many IPOs yet. There have been even fewer acquisitions. What's slowing the thing down? To me, it's obvious. It's the public that are slowing it down. Profits which is what investors care about, needs revenue. It needs customers. It needs customer demand. And that will only happen once treatments actually work. So the question is, what is the investor sentiment with regard to the likelihood that treatments will work well enough to create that demand? The fact is, you know, I'm a longevity optimist. I'm not exactly the first one. You know, there have been longevity optimists since the beginning of civilization, and they've always been wrong. So why the hell should you believe that I'm right? Okay? Um, so, you know, it makes sense. So, how can donations change this? Well, this is why I th how I think they can change it. If we were to get a really dramatic uh, success in the kinds of experiments that I've just described to you, that would, I'm going to say here, give people permission to get their hopes up. The, what do I mean by dramatic? Well, think about this. In the 1930s, people discovered that if you feed mice or rats maybe 30 or 40% less than they would like, then they live 30 or 40% longer. That's when you start early in life. But it's been like more than 50 years since people discovered that if you start around middle-aged, the same way that we are in our experiment, then you, know, you don't get 40%, but you get like 15%, right? Um, maybe that's like three months, four months of additional life. And it's healthy life that's added. So, that was a long time ago. 
And what do you know, boys and girls? We are still at that threshold. We have not significantly improved on those three or four months that you can get. So I want to get to a year. If we can get, by this kind of combination damage repair approach, if we can get a year of extra life on, the, on these mice, then I believe that we will be in a totally new world. Why? Because Oprah listens to experts. Oprah is a fundamentally, you know, she's an influencer, and so are all the others, whether it's Mr. Beast, whoever you want to talk about. They got that way by paying attention to experts. And the expert community has been very, very cautious in you know, avoiding any kind of over-promising and under-delivering. That, I believe, has been to a fault. It, it's gone too far. But the fact is, it is understandable, because experts, other than myself, are forced to make no enemies, because they get their money through peer review, which is the very worst invention in the whole history of science. Um, um, and, um, yeah, yeah, so you've got, to, you've got to not give people excuses to, to refuse to give you money. Uh, and you know, so we need to give experts the permission. And I believe that a dramatic improvement on what have been, has been possible so far, in terms of extending life starting in middle age, is what we need. You've got to get people to think that way. So finally, it comes down to this. You know, I just said that it's unfundable as an investment, right? That, that, Work like this is unfundable, but there's plenty of stuff that is fundable. That's why we're here, right? That's why we are. That's why an investors conference existed. And you want to maximise the value of the investments that you are making. Why do you think? Why do I think that extending lifespan by a year in these mice will do that? It's because when the wider world feels that it has permission to get their hopes up, you know, to actually expect that there will be true anti-aging medicine that works in time for them, then everything changes. There will be public pressure for modernization of the regulatory environment. And there will be, public, there will be enthusiasm from the people with, who write the biggest checks, Big Pharma. There will then be effective treatments a lot sooner. And those will be treatments that you guys will have funded at the startup level and that were maybe acquired by um, Big Pharma. So the revenue, the return on investment, will be dramatically increased by the achievement of what I'm calling robust mass rejuvenation. Now, is that, does that actually hang together? Are you thinking he's, he's totally delusional, he doesn't understand money? Well, think about the precedent. Look at these two people. You've probably seen them before, right? Um, it's, it's been the thing has been changed. But there's a couple of ticks there. Likes making money. Peter Thiel and Michael Grieve, you know, they are not exactly, you know, um, ashamed of having been successful in the private sector. But they also gave me money. Quite a lot of money. Over, in fact, like, you know, more than $5 million each um, uh, over those periods of years. Um, you may know that in the middle of that period, around 2012, um, Peter Thiel also gave a $100,000 grant to someone you'll be hearing from in about 40 minutes, and whom I highlighted when <coughs> I was standing here two years ago as someone without whom we probably wouldn't be here, Laura Deming, who kick-started the private sector in this area. Mm. Now, these two people are investing now, and um, they are going to be making a lot more money mm. out, of this, out of this sector than they would have made if they hadn't given me money in the past. So stay tuned, and um, this is what we're going to be doing, what we want to do next. And that's all I have to say. And I'm glad I got done before the music. <laughs> <clears throat>